All right, uh, so the name of my talk is Migrating from Kafka to RabbitMQ at SimpleBet, Why and How. Uh, so I'll reintroduce myself. My name is Dave Lucia. Uh, I'm VP of Engineering at a company called SimpleBet. And I'm uh, very into Elixir. I've been using Elixir for the last five years um, and could probably talk for, for hours about it. Um, Start off the top with, with uh, some pictures uh, of the dog and, and my son, Owen. Uh, I'm holding Shy Guy right here, and we've got Pearl in the background, who's in the other room. <laughs> All right, so let's start with, with SimpleBet and, and who we are. So our mission is to power the future of fan engagement. Uh, and the way that we're doing that is we're trying to make every moment of a sporting event a betting opportunity. Um, so we're doing this through what we call micro markets. So micro markets are focused around uh, small parts of a game. So um, in a football game, it's every drive or every play. Um, in a baseball game, it's every pitch or every at bat. Uh, for an NBA game, it's uh, every possession. And so what we do is we make those bettable occurrences. Uh, we provide odds for them. Um, and we allow other companies to take these markets and to offer them on their sports books or media companies to use them to provide interesting information as a game incentive. Um, so this is a, a sample of like some data that we would send. Um, so I'm going to use football as the example here, uh, but this is showing uh, a list of selections for a market um, and their probabilities and whether or not that selection won. Um, and so our product, what we're really doing here is we're providing a feed of this information in real time as the game is happening. So uh, within a fraction of a second from when something happens on the field, we're going to create a market, we're going to produce probabilities, and we're going to send that data out um, in a format not so different from what you see here. Um, we do this uh, with a lot of Elixir, um, and we also do this with uh, a bunch of machine learning models. Um, now, we take this feed, um, and I mentioned that we, we sell it to other companies, but we also uh, dog food that feed, and we build um, end user experiences uh, that look like this. So one of our first products that we had in market, we built for a company called FanDuel, and the app looked a lot like this. And what you're seeing is uh, betting on uh, the result of a drive and you're saying it's going to be a touchdown you're placing a five dollar bet with a 14 and 25 cent payout um, and you play games like this either as free to play or for real money um, and it's meant to enhance the experience of uh, watching a sporting event so in order to offer a product like this we have um, a data pipeline that the things need to move through um, so the first thing that needs to happen is we need to receive data about what's happening in the game. Um, once we have that data, we, we can then create the relevant markets. OK, there, in football, there is a, a drive that's about to start, so we'll create that market. We need to then run it through our machine learning models and produce odds. Um, and then finally, we need to publish those markets. And the publishing of the markets is the thing that I want to focus on today, um, because that's probably the most important piece. It's the interface to our customers and to our other uh, internal systems that are ultimately going to use the, the data and the probabilities to offer um, interesting end user products. OK, so my story starts in the beginning of SimpleBet when things were um, you know, really being decided. We we're trying to understand our architecture. Um, we were focusing on our core IP, which was uh, ingesting real-time data, producing markets and probabilities. Um, and in this time, there were, there were many open questions that needed to be solved. Um, so ultimately, the problem that we needed to solve was how do we take the data, that, you know, those probabilities that you saw earlier, um, and publish that in a way that um, they can go to all of our customers, that we can consume it, um, that we can distribute and filter the data in, um, in a relevant means. So it kind of looks something like this, right? Uh, you have multiple different sports. Um, within these sports, there's many different matches all happening um, at any particular time. 
Um, and we want to publish the data onto a message bus and then distribute that data to all the customers who are, are paying for that data or who want that data. Um, so you see here that customer A is getting football and basketball data while customer B is getting uh, basketball and baseball data. So there is a problem, one of distribution, getting it all to the relevant parties. I publish one message, it needs to go out two times. Um, and filtering, where I send one piece of information, I don't necessarily want it to go to all uh, parties, maybe just a particular one. Um, so when we were deciding what this message bus should be, uh, there were a few requirements that we had. So one was that it needed to be customizable per customer. Uh, we want to be able to send uh, data specialized per customer. Um, distributable, so we want to be able to, to fan data out. Um, with minimal latency, so uh, if you're dealing with real-time data, uh, speed is crucial. Um, and so it, we need to send a message and it needs to arrive uh, uh, very quickly. Um, and then it also needs to be durable and fault tolerant. So if there's um, any sort of issue or reconnect on our uh, consumer side, um, the, the data is still there. Um, so enter Kafka. So Kafka is a, uh, this is from their website, a distributed event streaming platform for high performance data pipelines, streaming analytics, data integration, and mission critical applications. Um, and another thing from their website, these are the core cap capabilities of high throughput, scalability, permanent storage, high availability. Um, and so Kafka was shiny. And initially, um, when we're trying to, you know, in the early days of the company, we're trying to find a message bus. Um, this seemed like the right fit. You know, it had a reputation for being fast. Uh, we're in, you know, nascent uh, customer integration territory where you know, we don't really have any customers yet, so it's really unclear what challenges will be. Um, but we felt that Kafka would be um, a decent fit. Um, so our architecture looks something like this, where we have a publisher for every uh, different sport or league, um, and that would be published on a topic um, through the Kafka broker. And then to solve that problem of distribution, we didn't necessarily want to have a single topic that every customer would read from. Um, instead, what we'd use is um, an open source technology called uh, Mirror Maker, which would then replicate logs out to um, customer specific brokers. And then they'd have sort of a sandbox of their data that they can read from. Um, and so after we started using Kafka, we nearly immediately started uh, running into a number of dilemmas. And these dilemmas started to um, appear when we started talking to customers um, and getting it set up, working with it locally. Um, so I want to I go through some of those dilemmas. Um, so the first bit was on using Kafka in the first place. Um, and I'm not even talking about in production. I'm just talking about using it locally. Um, you need to deploy at least these five things and maybe more to just get started with it. So you need to deploy the, the broker, um, which is the message bus, the system that is reading uh, and writing data. Um, you need the Kafka REST proxy, which is a um, REST interface for talking to services within uh, this cluster. There's the schema registry, which is um, how you interact with the the schemas uh, that you're publishing to topics. Um, the Kafka UI, which is another service where you can view data on topics and skim through um, partitions and whatnot. And then Zookeeper, which is uh, you know, managing your cluster of Kafka. So this is a lot of complexity locally. And then it's even more complexity when you want to push it out to all of your environments and get it up and running. Um, so I mentioned earlier that we had a Kafka broker per customer, um, and this meant that we had a Terraform script, and any time we wanted to provision a new customer, we needed to provision new uh, infrastructure. A um, lot, lot to deal with there. Um, the next was around, the next dilemma was around the partitioning uh, topic strategy, our Kafka TPS reports. Um, so 
making a decision around publishing data is is not just a publisher responsibility it's a consumer responsibility as well um so one thing that we found ourselves doing before we even really had any customers was asking the question of what in which way should our customers consume our data um should there be a topic per customer by the way topic is analogous to a queue in rabbit queue but uh, should there be a topic per customer and we just dump all data onto that and it's their responsibility to filter and distribute it on their end um, maybe for every sport match we'll create a new topic um, could be a better fit or maybe per league we just have one per league and all data goes on to there um, ultimately we felt that this was a really hard problem to solve and it seemed like we might need to have sort of a different a different topic strategy for every customer. Um, and that felt um, not quite like what we were looking for in customizability. Um, so then we have the issue of, okay, we want to publish data and it needs to be customizable per customer. Um, how do we do that? Maybe we deploy um, yet another service that is a you know stream processor that takes in data, looks at a customer configuration, and then replicates that onto their topics. Um, we didn't find that we had anything out of the box that could easily do that in Kafka. Okay, data retention. So Kafka, one of its main tenants is the ability to store data indefinitely on disk. And it does it by default, that's, you know, it, it, it's a, a log of data um, and it's what makes it fast. Um, but it also means that um, now that data is sitting around on disk and you need to decide when to clean it up. Um, that also means that stale messages are going to sit um, on disk and potentially ready for your customers to read stale data. Um, so that was another question of how do we, how do we solve this problem? Uh, what do we do with data uh, that's not being read? Um, authentication authorization. We wanna have our customers connect to their sandbox um, how do you do that in Kafka? Well, there is a solution, but it is not a Kafka solution. It is a managed Kafka solution that a particular vendor provides. And it, adding to the moving parts, you would uh, deploy a metadata service, which is just yet another uh, thing to deal with. Um, and there's role-based access control. And you know, I'm sure if we got it you know, set up, it would have been fine, but um, what? Um, and then just on top of that, here, here's some other things that we found that we were pushing onto our customers that were complex uh, as we were choosing Kafka as our message broker. Um, so I mentioned the schema registry, but also Avro is the uh, serialization format of choice for Kafka. And uh, it's not a particularly popular um, serialization format outside of Kafka. So this was a new thing that our customers were gonna need to learn. Um, the problem of managing offsets um, so with Kafka, you need to sort of remember where you are in the topic, in the log, um, and that's sort of your, your point in place for where to, to read from next. Um, there's a lot of questions on how to persist that, how to deal with it, what partition to read from. Um, where do we deploy uh, different types of data? Maybe um, for production data, it makes sense to, to write to uh, maybe a match topic. But if we want to have data that's a replay of a previous match for integration purposes, um, we didn't feel like we had a good solution there. And then the last piece of complexity we're pushing onto our customers was the Kafka protocol itself. So dealing with Kafka um, requires a bit of tuning and uh, a bit of know-how about how the actual protocol works in order to work with it effectively. Um, and this meant that we were either going to have to educate our customers on how to deal with Kafka, uh, we we're going to have to write a bunch of client libraries, um, or we we're going to have to put something in front of Kafka itself uh, to make the integration easier. Um, so in summary, as we you know, got deeper into this Kafka message broker, uh, we felt that we were making our customers uh, you know, be educated on Kafka. Um, we felt that with all of the moving parts, there were a lot of points of failure that we we're going to need to deal with. Um, that we're potentially going to even need to expose uh, metrics on for our customers so they can 
can know how the particular thing is up or slow or having an issue. Um, we felt that the all of this complexity that we're pushing onto our customer was actually going to affect the time to market because it was going to increase the amount of time it took to integrate with our odds feed um, and to get data out of our platform. Um, adding complexity, hard to use, and ultimately expensive. So again, this was in the early days of, of SimpleBet where you're talking to our first customers. Uh, we're not quite integrated with them yet. We had chosen Kafka as this initial solution and we're having these conversations and realizing, wow, if we continue with Kafka, we're gonna have potentially a lot of problems. Um, so we started to, to look around and see what other uh, potential solves can we have here as a, as a message bus. Um, so we, we didn't look too far. Um, one thing that we did look at um, that I'm not going to spend too much time on is we did look at things like GraphQL uh, streams. Uh, we did look at things like, uh, you know, chunked HTTP server side events, uh, but we felt that that was only solving the last mile problem. And we were looking for more of a comprehensive solution where we could solve uh, sort of the distribution and filtering bits, as well as providing a nice customer interface. Um, so that's where Rabin and Q started to enter the picture. Um, so as we started to look at this, we were trying to remember, okay, what are the actual problems that we needed to solve for sending data to our customers? Uh, so one, integrations should be familiar. Uh, so close to what you know they probably know from working with other companies. Um, it should be customizable. We should be able to um, have an integration that uh, picks and chooses the types of messages we wanna send. Um, and it should be easy to provision. So standing up a new customer should be as simple as clicking a button um, and not uh, expensive where we're going through Terraform and uh, deploying new AWS resources to get things up. Um, so things that we liked off the bat about RabbitMQ, uh, one was the fact that we had a standard-based means of integrating with it through AMQP. Um, the next was the RabbitMQ management interface, which is deployed as uh, a plugin. And we felt that as we started to look more and more at RabbitMQ, um, this wasn't a bunch of microservices working in conjunction. It was just one system that you could layer on new functionality to. Um, and it you know, seemed to do everything out of the box and sometimes more. So this is the architecture that we, and near, uh, the architecture that we ended up going with with uh, RabbitMQ. And it, it doesn't look so different, but I think the main thing to take away from this is that we have a single cluster, um, this external facing cluster that we deploy in a three node configuration. And rather than redeploying new nodes for each customer, uh, we deploy a new vhost within that cluster. And our customers will log into their vhost We'll have a series of resources, exchanges, queues uh, that will be set up for them. Um, and this is all easily deployed by using the RabbitMQ management API. Um, and we have an internal admin dashboard where we can click a button. It generates uh, a new vhost and new topology. Um, and all of the data is just there. And it's sandboxed. And it works great. Um, so at the top, you're seeing uh, all the data that we're producing, and that data gets produced with uh, different headers, um, and it gets published into an internal vhost, uh, an internal exchange on an internal vhost. Um, and then we have shovels that bind on the particular data that we want our customers to get. So maybe we have um, Major League Baseball who only wants baseball data. Um, so we'll bind uh, at, in a fan out exchange a shovel that is bound to MLB. Um, and then MLB data will flow into their exchange in their customer specific vhost, um, and they can bind their own queues and filter the data even more if they so choose. Um, so on the topic of serialization, while Kafka kind of pushes you in the direction of Avro uh, using the schema registry, um, RabbitMQ does not really prescribe any sort of serialization format. Um, and so we just kept it simple and used JSON. Um, and while it's not uh, fully structured, it's been working well enough for us. 
Uh, you can get fancy and you can gzip it. You can uh, use message pack, but JSON has been getting us pretty far. Um, authentication and authorization works out of the box. You can configure it and see everything in the RabbitMQ management interface. Um, we have a vhost for customer, and that means that customer logs in um, through their vhost. We can provision actually multiple consumers uh, for every customer that each get their own vhost. And because they're not that expensive to provision, uh, this provides this really nice sandbox environment where if we're replaying data for integration purposes, into one exchange, that's not going to affect uh, one developer who's integrating versus another. Um, on data retention, so we have durable and quorum queues on our side. Uh, and this makes sure that data is highly available and that um, if you reconnect, it, it stays around. Um, and reads are destructive, which can be a good or a bad thing, depending on your perspective. But for us, it meant that if a um, consumer is reading data, that data is not going to be just left around. And in a real-time data system, this is really important that you're not uh, serving your customers raw uh, stale data. Um, and then for historical purposes, we offer HTTP APIs where they can fetch this data uh, later for analysis or for whatever their purposes may be. Um, so I, I mentioned this in the architecture before, but serving data a la carte in RabbitMQ is really, really uh, flexible, um, and that can be done through binding. So we publish to this top level fan out exchange, and then we use uh, a combination of shovels and uh, exchange to exchange bindings to, to route data. And the headers dictate the flow of that data. Um, and this provides a robust and arbitrary means for which we can decide to filter data. Um, and we can make uh, sort of improvements uh, and tweaks to this over time so that we can customize uh, the routing, filtering, and distribution of our data uh, over time. Uh, topic and partitioning strategy, it's really simple. Let the customer decide. We don't um, create any queues for our customers up front. Um, they, they can declare and bind their own queues, and that means that they can have uh, a wide range of data in a queue, or they can filter it down to very specific data uh, for particular sports, message types, market types, uh, whatever it may be, um, all enabled by headers exchanges. Um, and then I think one of the, the most important things that we were getting out of RabbitMQ is AMQP. And AMQP um, provides the standard means of integration, standard based means of integration um, that solves a lot of the problems with designing a business to business uh, interface for data. Um, so initially, when we started moving to RabbitMQ, we started to build uh, HTTP APIs for declaring queues and sort of setting things up um, and quickly threw them away when we realized that AMQP has really solved this problem really well and really elegantly. Um, and as long as you get your permissions right, you can sort of throw your users into this, this Viho sandbox and let them tweak and customize things however they see fit and however is best for their platform. Um, so in summary with RabbitMQ, uh, batteries are included. The moving parts are pretty minimal. Uh, once you get your cluster set up or use the, a managed solution, um, everything that you might want is, is pretty much there um, and it keeps improving over time. Um, lower cost because there is less infrastructure to deploy. Um, things work really well out of the box. And um, if you're willing to deploy your own infrastructure, there's uh, you know, not really many moving parts. So you can get it out very quickly and have your SRE and DevOps team working on uh, higher value things. Um, found it to be higher reliability. So because you're deploying less services, there's less to worry about going down. Uh, integration was easier through the familiar AMQP uh, standard. Um, and the, the learning curve was gentle. Um, you really don't need to know a ton about the inners of uh, RabbitMQ to get started uh, with, with Rabbit. If, if, you're, if you're comfortable with the concept of queues and publishing data and you know how to read uh, simple serialization formats, um, it's going to get you really far. Um, so this was a little bit of a whirlwind tour of 
plus moving from Kafka to RabbitMQ. Um, and maybe a piece that I've left out is that we sort of had this migration at, at a blessed time where it was right on the cusp of being going from uh, a pre uh, product and market company to a product and market company. And so as we're seeing this problem emerge, we were able to identify this is not going to be the best uh, means to offer our software as a service uh, solution. Um, and so we were kind of we were graced with being able to stand up RabbitMQ, deprecate the Kafka, and not have to move all of our customers over. Um, so we've been running this in production now since June of last year. Uh, we have many customers connecting to uh, Rabbit via AMQP. Um, and most of them have been pretty happy with this integration and have found it to be really simple and really um, easy to work with. Uh, provisioning new customers onto our platform is as simple as clicking a button that makes some HTTP calls out. Um, and we've loved RabbitMQ so much that it is, we've now deployed an internal cluster and we've been using it uh, to solve more and more problems for uh, our distributed systems and uh, expanding our platform. So if anything here that I spoke about was interesting to you, uh, we are hiring. We write a lot of Elixir at SimpleBet. Um, it's our secret weapon, uh, as well as RabbitMQ. Uh, we also do machine learning with a lot of Python. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. Uh, my handle's at the bottom if you, uh, or on the Whova app, uh, or in the Toucan Lounge. I'm happy to answer any questions uh, about hiring or, or anything else. Uh, and it looks like I spoke fast enough that we still have some time for questions. Thank you. Excellent. Everyone. Thank you very much, Dave. Uh, we had one question coming in here, uh, which is which AMQP client API uh, do you use? Which AMQP client API? Okay, so is that a question of protocol or of language? No, I think they uh, are referring to which actual client library you're using. Okay, so uh, I'll talk on the publisher side and the consumer side. So on the publisher side, we're using, so all of our services that publish to uh, RabbitMQ for external purposes are Elixir services. And we use the AMQP Elixir library that is a wrapper around the Erlang uh, AMQP library. Um, so, and that uses the AMQP 091 protocol. Um, and then on the consumer side of things, um, we're using the same library internally. As I mentioned, we dog food our APIs um, and use that to build more products. Um, our customers tend to use Python and C Sharp uh, for Python, I believe. Pika and Kombu are the favorites um, for C-sharp. I don't remember off the top of my head. Okay. Um, another question was, you, you mentioned that you use an HTTP API if you want historical events. Um, do you envision using um, streams when that comes in 3.9 uh, as another way to have repeat reads? For historical data? Um, we do intend to use streams. Um, as far as a means for um, replacing those HTTP APIs, I think what's nice about the HTTP APIs is that you can build additional features on top of it um, that the raw uh, queuing protocol might not give you. So additional filtering options, um, I don't know, creative sorting and things like that. Um, I do see streams as a really interesting solution for some of our internal problems that we have, uh, problems that Kafka might've been a good fit for. Um, so we're, we're excited to, to play around with that. Good. Uh, do all customers share the same RabbitMQ cluster and how do you handle scaling needs of your service? Good question. Uh, yes, so our customers do um, handle or are, are on the same RabbitMQ cluster. Um, how do we handle scaling? Um, so I think one of the things that we reached to Kafka for early on was that we thought we we're going to have to solve this massive scaling problem. Um, and what we ended up realizing is that the volume of data that we have is very, very small relatively. So we're doing like one or two messages per second at peak. Uh, which is nearly nothing. 
because uh, if you think about it, we're sending messages in response to things that are happening in a sporting event. Um, and this is queued off of data being entered into the system. So there's not such a high frequency of inbound data into our system. And thus, the outbound data is also of lower frequency. Um, so we have, uh, you know, several handful of customers, um, and they are happily coexisting on the same RabbitMQ cluster. Good, good, good. Um, any tips or experience to share about working with RabbitMQ and Elixir? Tips to share. So I actually had um, a new uh, member join the engineering team um, at SimpleBet um, about a month and a half ago. Um, and one of the questions uh, that he was asking me was, I'm really interested in RabbitMQ. Um, how do I get started? Um, and so what I said was, Okay, first off, here, here's a, a few books, RabbitMQ in action. You can read those, um, but I actually recommend opening up the RabbitMQ uh, management interface, um, giving him a, a Docker Compose file that spins up a local cluster. So run Docker Compose up with this, uh, then poke around the RabbitMQ management interface, create a simple topology where you spin up an exchange, uh, bind a queue to that exchange, and see if you can produce some data. And just by doing that, you really start to build a mental model for how the pieces connect together. Um, and he found that that was actually a really good introduction. Um, so once you start to do that, then it's like, okay, now let's write some code that can produce data um, and see if we can have it uh, pop its head on the other end of, of the system. Um, and, and that was a really, I think a really, good way to, to start learning it. Then when you start to get deeper into RabbitMQ and learn about some of the more advanced features, things we're excited about are things like uh, consistent hash exchanges, quorum queues, the new streaming features. Uh, the documentation for RabbitMQ has always been a great source of information and where I, I point people to next. Related to that, how do you manage RabbitMQ connection pools in Elixir? Have you worked with X rabbit pool lib for that at all? Uh, yes, yes, we, we actually do use X rabbit pool um, for, for some publishing needs. Um, but I think internally we're starting to move towards managing uh, those sorts of things ourselves. Uh, there's some minor issues that we have with publishing with X rabbit pool. Um, I think I've contributed some small things to that library even, um, but yeah, it, it's an option, but if you want to do things like publisher confirms um, and you know manage your resources a little bit uh, finer, uh, that may or may not be your, your best solution. So just spinning up um, a connection in a gen server in Elixir uh, is pretty straightforward. And as long as you know how to uh, monitor the process that's managing it, it, it's a really good way to get started. Good. Um, what is your infrastructure um, like? Where have you deployed Rabbit? Uh, so we're deploying Rabbit in Kubernetes. Um, and I actually pointed our SRE team to some of the talks today because I, I believe that we could probably uh, remove a lot of configuration from some of the newer uh, Kubernetes operators that are offered for, for RabbitMQ. So uh, we, our SRE team has a lot of experience deploying RabbitMQ at, at previous jobs. Um, and so we were able to stand up something uh, relatively quickly ourselves. Uh, but I think now that there's more options out there, we might uh, reevaluate that in the near future. Nice. Um, that was all the questions I had right now. Um, and um, yeah, feel free to, to uh, we, we still have five minutes. So if, if there are more questions, feel free to ask them straight uh, ahead. I wonder if uh, I, maybe I can ask a question. If anyone in the audience has uh, tried deploying Kafka as an external facing interface at their company. Or RabbitMQ for that matter. Yeah.